Very good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the FB live session at NCSM today. Um, today, I've been uh, tasked to give you a talk on updates in cancer therapy, so we shall uh, begin. So, cancer, as you know, has long been one of the most devastating and confounding health, uh, health concerns worldwide. So, cancer causes havoc in our body, it causes a lot of uh, health related issues. And uh, not just that the cancer affects the person or the patient that suffers from the cancer, it also affects their loved ones, also affects their family, and also affects their career, for example, their work, their day-to-day -day activities. And in terms of um, uh, end result of cancer is of course death, and that's something that we would like to avoid in patients who have been diagnosed with cancer. And of course, uh, another thing to consider is actually the, the implication on the social economic issues of the patient and also the nation where the patient comes from. So if you've uh, been wondering why cancer happened and, and how do normal cells become cancerous before we even begin to discuss uh, treatment of cancer, you must understand that a normal cell become cancerous because they acquire some mutations. So mutations are actually changes that occur within the cell that leads to the cell constantly and can continuously changing and changing as they acquire more and more mutation until the end result is the malignant cell or the cancer forming. Okay. So why the cancer happen? Why the mutation happen? There are a lot of factors that, that come to play and why that happens. So it can be carcinogen, it can be radiation, it can be aging processes, it can be due to hereditary conditions. So all this leads to the cell uh, developing three characteristics as you can see here. I give an example of a breast tumor. You can see that one characteristic is uncontrolled growth. Okay? So the cancer will grow and grow and grow from just one single cell that has developed a mutation. It grows and then it goes to invade the neighboring tissue into the lymphatic system for example and then it will go into the lymph and, and also the blood vessels and then spread to other parts of the body. So, so three characteristics of cancer that we need to understand before we even begin to treat cancer that is grow uncontrollably, invade adjacent tissues and then metastasize. Right? So cancer can happen in any parts of our body as you can see. I gave an example of breast cancer but you can see here that um, there are other parts of the body that can uh, develop cancer. And if you want to like generalize it, the general or, or as a whole, the cancer types can be uh, divided into carcinomas, sarcomas, melanomas, lymphoma, tumors, cancerous tumors, and we also have childhood tumors. Okay. So please remember that when you leave the cancer untreated, or if you treat the cancer with a wrong treatment, then it can cause complication and death. But if you diagnose it early and you treat it appropriately at the correct timing, the correct place, it can be cured. All right? So this is our National Cancer Registry report, the latest one that came out recently. And you could see here for Malaysian females, the top three cancers are breast, colorectal and lung. And uh, for male, the top three cancers are colorectal, lung and then lymphoma. But these are the most common uh, cases in Malaysia and, and uh, much of the discussion will also uh, be on the common cancers. So when somebody is diagnosed with cancer, the, the, the person must be allowed the opportunity to discuss all the treatment options with the team that manages the cancer. So there's no one person that manages cancer alone. So it's always managed by a team of professionals and allied health professionals to treat the cancer. So we, when we discuss the, the type of cancer uh, treatment, we will discuss what is the type of the cancer, what is the extent of the cancer, means what is the stage of the cancer, then how do we prognosticate the patient? So whether we are going to treat the patient for cure if they have early stage cancer or we are treating them to palliate their symptoms, to give them a better quality of life and maybe prolong a bit their survival. Okay. So we also look at what would be the patient's fitness to actually undergo the treatment that we plan for them. So whether they are, the organ function is good for such, such, such uh, treatment uh, uh, planning. And then what would be the treatment choice uh, for the patient is either it's a combination a strategy or, or it's a sequential therapy for example. And then we also discuss what would be the short and long term effects of the treatment and what is the cost, how, how cost effective is the treatment that we discuss for the patient. So this is 
often often something that we must remember a multidisciplinary approach for the cancer care in order for us to give the best uh, result for the patient. So cancer has been um, treated for so 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 many years. So this is just to show you a cancer timeline from when cancer was first identified in 2000 BC and then uh, for the first treatment of cancer in breast, for example, in, in 1880, uh, the radical mastectomy, and we have had so, so many um, uh, treatment uh, advances in cancer, and, and this has led to a very transformative um, cancer care in the last 20 to 30 years. And the cancer care or progress that I, 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 I will discuss a bit about uh, has been in in, in many aspects of cancer. So in the past decade, we have had uh, progress in many measures, not just in cancer treatment like chemotherapy, for example, but also in, in terms of surgical advances. We have better surgery now. We have precision medicine. We are tailoring the therapy according to the patient's uh, characteristics within their cancer. We also have preventive strategy where we have uh, identified who are the people who are most susceptible to get cancers and we identified how we can vaccinate certain viruses that may, may cause cancer. We also have better uh, improvement in uh, dealing with cancer's uh, treatment side effects. For example, we have better anti um drugs for, for nausea vomiting and also we have a better survivorship uh, uh, efforts, especially in advocacy. So, this is showing, uh, this data basically shows you in a well-resourced uh, country in the US, you could see that there's a tremendous progress seen. You can see that the survival of cancer has increased and the mortality means the death of cancer has actually come down so, so well. Okay, so we in Malaysia, we would like to get this kind of result if possible, right? So, before we go to treatment, I would like to discuss with you about prevention. We are busy with COVID-19 at the moment. So, COVID-19 is due to the coronavirus. But there is a virus in cancer that you all must know, okay? That is called the human papilloma virus. And what are the cancers that they are related to? So, what is HPV or human papilloma virus, right? So, it is a virus that infects the human skin and the mucosal surface in a, in a person and it's transmitted easily by touching and it's also classified by WHO as a carcinogen that it causes cancer. So in the US, again the US as, a, as an example, the, the disease that, that HPV causes uh, is, is up to 20, 27,000 uh, uh, cases where they develop HPV related cancers. So the cancers that you must remember that is probably caused by HPV, this is an example in the United States, you could see here in women, in women, the cancer that is uh, most probably caused by HPV is majority is the cancer, cancer of the cervix. While in men, majority is the oropharyngeal cancer, which is cancer affecting the mouth, or the mucosal surface of the mouth, the oropharynx, you know, the tonsil. So it's very, very important that although we know already maybe that HPV causes or is, is, is linked to uh, cervical cancer, not many of us may know that it is linked to ovarian cancer in men. So the, the question is, why do we have to vaccinate men in women? Okay, so we vaccinate in order to prevent HPV associated cancers, the, one, the, 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 the cancers here that, that you could see here. And you must remember that anyone can be exposed to HPV and these infections can be like not. So everyone is at risk. So can we now protect our Sign our boys from HPV related cancers? Yes, we can. Okay, so oropharyngeal cancers are more common in men and we must vaccinate if we can because there's no screening test for them. For cervical cancer, we can do pap smear, cervical smear, but for, for men, if they are um, infected with HPV, then we cannot actually screen them. So we, we, we must try to actually vaccinate them. So these are the available HPV vaccines. So Discuss with your doctors, discuss with your general practitioners, with your ONG doctors, your urology doctors, and discuss and actually uh, and find out about this. Okay. okay, what about hereditary cancer? So you remember that I mentioned there are multi multiple causes for cancer, and one of the causes that occurs is a little, a small proportion of patients is hereditary causes. That means the patients, when they uh, were born, they uh, were born with a defective gene that causes them to be more susceptible to develop cancer when they are older. Okay, so one of the the, the person that is very famous uh, in this aspect is Angelina Jolie, where she 
she uh, was found to carry the gene and therefore she has done some preventive uh, measures in order for her not to develop cancers that is associated with her carrying the gene. Okay? So the, 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 the gene is called BRCA1 and BRCA2. So this BRCA, this BRCA gene or breast cancer, uh, breast and ovarian cancer related gene um, has been found to appear in about 15% uh, of ovarian cancer patients and about 5-10% to 10 of breast cancer patients. So in patients who, when, in, in basically not patients, in individuals who were born with a mutation in this BRCA gene, they carry a risk to develop ovarian cancer, to develop breast cancer, as well as other cancers such as pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer and melanoma depending on what, what sex uh, they are. Okay? So they, uh, they may not have family history of cancer. So BRCA mutation, uh, a BRCA mutation carrier may not have family history of cancer. So this is something that we must also remember from this talk. Okay? And in order for us to know whether we are carriers or not, we can only do BRCA mutation testing. So that not necessarily that you don't have family history and you don't have BRCA. So you can actually do now BRCA mutation testing and it's already, it's already available in our country. Okay? So these are basically to show uh, what is the difference for, patient, for women who has a uh, uh, breast and ovarian cancer in terms of how much uh, they, they differ from normal people who do not carry the mutation. So this is the lifetime risk for them. For example, for, for somebody who has a BRCA mutation, up to when they are 50 years old, the likelihood of them uh, developing cancer is about 51% compared to just 2% for people who do not have the BRCA mutation. But while people who have uh, up to 70 years old, they have up to 87% of developing cancer compared to just 8% for patients uh, who do not carry the mutation. But this is for breast. But for ovarian cancer, for those who carry the BRCA, they have a risk of developing cancer up to 65% by the time they, they reach age 70 compared to less than 1% in the normal patient population. So BRCA mutation is, um, is something that, that has to be uh, looked at and of course uh, the screening guidelines for carriers have been put into our CPG, you know, clinical practice guideline application, and we have done, we have had so many uh, efforts, like for example, the mainstreaming effort by Cancer uh, Clinical Research Malaysia, Cancer Research Malaysia, uh, that that tries to um, for us to improve on on uh, mutation testing, screening, as well as management of patients with this cancer. Alright, so I finished with the prevention preventive strategy, the advances that we should know once HPV and the vaccine that is available and the other one is uh, BRCA mutation that we can actually test for if we can be the risk. Okay? And this is something again for you to discuss with the team that is managing you. Right? So for systemic therapy for cancer, so systemic therapy means that we are talking about drugs, okay? medicines that we can give to the patient and the medicine will be spread throughout the body to treat cancer cells wherever the cancer cells may be. Right? So this is not talking about radiation, this is not talking about surgery where you only address the cancer at the location the cancer is. This one is talking about systemically everywhere. So when we talk about systemic therapy, we have of course the old uh, standard and goal uh, treatment which is chemotherapy and we also have hormonal therapy or endocrine therapy that we use to treat breast and prostate cancers. And we also have biological agents or targeted therapy. So targeted therapy is, is a very, very um, is a, it's considered as treatment advanced. It's also something that a lot of you would like to know about. Okay. So we also have immunotherapy. So also another uh, treatment advances that a lot of patients ask uh, about uh, in terms of treating cancer with immunotherapy, and there's also vaccine therapy. Okay. So the chemotherapy, which is a, a drug that we use to kill cancer cells directly, and um, the uh, treatment is based on the chemotherapy drugs uh, interfering with the DNA of the cell, so making the cell die. And chemotherapy is still a, a treatment that we use to treat a lot of cancers for curative purposes as well as as adjunct to other uh, treatment as well as uh, and also uh, to control uh, some advanced cancers. Okay? But uh, we are now going towards uh, precision medicine whereby, for example, if you use chemotherapy to treat cancers, you, it's, it's a very generic or very generalized uh, cancer therapy. But precision medicine calls for us to give a better care for each individual patient where we, we uh, use uh, research findings and we use 
a further understanding, a more deepening understanding of the tumor biology, the tumor characteristics, what happened within the the in, inside of the cell, you know, the 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 molecule, you know, the, the pathway of growth, the pathway of how, why the cells invade into adjacent structures, why the cell can have the characteristic or behavior of able being able to actually uh, metastasize, you know, go into the bloodstream and spread. Right? So we want to identify uh, what is the most important mutation, what is driving the cancer to happen and from identifying the most important mutation, we identify how can we target it with some therapies. So we want to refine our treatment approaches, we identify this uh, combination uh, that we can uh, use best for each patient. Okay? So these are just to show you a, a, a timeline basically on when was the first uh, targeted therapy used when when we used precision medicine uh, when we treated cancer in 1997. So the first targeted th uh, therapy that was used uh, for cancer therapy is uh, rituximab, and this began from rituximab began uh, our uh, journey where cancers can be classified by what are the molecular uh, abnormalities that the cancer has, and then we can actually match. A treatment and get a success when this treatment is matched to the, what uh, abnormality that we identify. So from rituximab, we had trastuzumab for, for metastatic, uh, metastatic or inundated early breast cancer or HER to positive eye and then subsequently we had inactivate and then we have had hundreds, hundreds of drugs or approved targeted cancer drugs with respective indication for whatever cancers that uh, it has been um, tested upon. So, what are targeted therapies? Okay, so targeted therapies is different from chemo because these are drugs that block the growth and spread of cancer by interfering with parts of the cells, parts of the molecule that is involved in cancer growth and cancer progression and basically cancer behavior. So that's that's targeted therapy. And what are the parts? Do not worry about this picture, okay? But basically, just is just to show you that within a cell there are many, many, many um, targets, or many, many processes, or many, many um, you know pathways that has uh, been identified that may be involved in cancer. So we are trying to look at how we can target each of the pathway with targeted therapy. So this is an example of one targeted therapy that has been shown to be very successful. So get for GIST, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, the target is the oncogene kit which is mutated in this tumor. And when we identify this in that particular uh, person's tumor, then we can target it with imatinib, which is a, the, the drug for it. And we can actually show that GIST, which is a, res a very resistant uh, tumor that usually not responsive to chemo or radiotherapy, but when you can target with the drug, the tablet, then they can get, they can, uh, the patient can actually get a very, very good response. You can see that there's a disappearance of the cancer in the liver of this patient, and you can see that it's no longer there. Even after just one week of screening therapy, and then after that, uh, after two months, the cancer is gone. Okay? So this is a melanoma. Okay, melanoma is, is, a, is a very aggressive form of skin cancer, and this, uh, the researchers have identified uh, BRAF as a target uh, uh, mutation within this uh, type of cancer and they identified it and then they, they uh, developed a drug against the target and you could see that in this patient with multiple uh, melanoma, melanoma sites in his body and when he is treated with the correct treatment that is targeting what is the problem with this cancer then you get a disappearance of the cancer. Okay? Now, what about side effects of targeted therapy? So, are they similar to chemotherapy? But because, the thing is, because you are identifying characteristics of the tumor, and this characteristic of the tumor is not available in our normal cell. So when you give the targeted therapy to a person that has that target within the tumor, the targeted therapy is going to just address the targets within the tumor. So you would have, uh, theoretically, and, and also generally, a lesser side effects compared to chemotherapy. So you can see here the side effect of this drug is quite uh, general, like tiredness, maybe cough, maybe nausea, a bit of nausea, but mild, skin rash, and, and maybe decreased appetite. But it's actually very, very well manageable, and it is not a serious illusion. Okay. 
And this is the this is to show you for lung cancer. Uh, for lung cancer, we, uh, few mutation that has been identified in this cancer, and we have actually uh, already used it uh, quite quite largely in our in our clinic uh, these days. It, when we, we, I'm sorry about the the, <laughs> the picture because it's not so so obvious. But basically, just to show you that in lung cancer, non small cell like lung cancer, we have identified a few mutations, and one of the earliest. One that we uh, know that our cancer patients uh, have, which is EGFR, which is epidermal growth factor receptor. So, in patients with non small cell lung cancer advanced stage who has been shown to have that mutation in their tumor, in Asia and in Malaysia, we have about 40% of our patients have been shown to harbor that mutation. So, we can actually target it, and these are the tablets that we can use to target the EGFR mutation in lung cancer and you could see that when we can treat these patients with this uh, drug you can get tremendous and, and very very rapid and good response means that the disappearance or the control of the cancer within the patient who has not been treated so this is the impact to show you so for example if I have uh, uh, EGFR mutation uh, mutated positive lung cancer and if I were to be treated with chemotherapy okay, standard platinum level chemotherapy in those years, then probably my expected uh, survival from my lung cancer is about 8 months. Okay? But if I were to have um, drugs that are selected, targeted for that particular mutation, that I may have uh, a survival that is m many, many times more than just 8 months, so about 3 years. Maybe, and now we have uh, even 5 years old and more than that. Okay? So this is in ALK, positive lung cancer, just, just now was EGFR mutation, positive lung cancer in ALK, which is another mutation that we can identify in lung cancer, can also get a very rapid response. You can see here. For breast cancer, which is, which is a subject that is very close to my heart because I have a lot of patients with breast cancer, we have had uh, a lot of uh, progress, a lot of advances, a lot of updates in patients who have advanced breast cancer. And we know that advanced breast cancer is, uh, is, is, is a difficult uh, uh, cancer to treat, and the survival of patients with advanced breast cancer is often poor. So in, in treating these patients uh, with advanced breast cancer, we look at what are their breast cancer subtypes, whether they have HER2 positive type cancer, or whether they have ER positive or HER2 negative type cancer, or whether they have triple negative type cancer. So there have been some updates and some advances in this patient population. For example, in HER2 positive uh, at metastatic breast cancer, this is a cancer that is uh, characterized by uh, an excessive presence of the HER2 molecule within the cancer. So this HER2 molecule is again the target and we identify that this, there is an extra number of this target. So what happened is there has been a development of so many drugs that target this target and that has led to the outcome, meaning the survival outcome, how long the patient survived the cancer after they have been treated with, uh, with a treatment that targets uh, what type cancer that they have, you can see here, if the patient is treated with just standard chemotherapy alone, then the survival is actually quite low. But if they are treated with uh, anti HER2 therapies that target that, the, the, the cancer that they have, then you get again uh, you know, a very, very marked uh, improvement of their survival uh, from their cancer. Okay? In patients who have hormone receptor positive, they are negative, advanced breast cancer, we have also had tremendous um, uh, outcome. When we treat them with drugs, for example, CDK 46 inhibitors, together with the usual standard hormonal therapy that we have used uh, before this. Okay? And now we, have, we, we learned that people who are treat, uh, being treated with CDK 46 inhibitors have a survival more than 5 years. So, this is stage 4 disease. It used to be between 6 months to about 2 years. Now they are surviving 5 years and beyond. Okay? So, that's a very good thing. So, what about immunotherapy? So immunotherapy is again one of the treatment advances for the last uh, decade, I would say. So there has been many drugs that have been uh, developed in order uh, in, in, in the immunotherapy armamentarium. So you have um, treatments that are being introduced as early as 2011, and then since then you have had again um, many many types of immunotherapy uh, being introduced. So we need to learn and we need to understand uh, how does immunotherapy help in treating cancers and that is based on our understanding that in our body the immune system are supposed to be there and supposed to actually um, target or, uh, or attack our, our cancer cells so what happens is 
if uh, the cancer cells is there, then the immune systems are supposed to kick them out or, or kill them. But because uh, the cancer may actually be smart and they are not, uh, they are able to make the immunotherapy do not kill them, then we need the immunotherapy drugs in order for us to overcome that problem. So this is a cartoon to show that for you know in our body, if you have a tumor cell and you have an immune cell that is that is uh, um, um, working, then the, the the immune cell will actually recognize or or, or see the, the tumor cell, and then when they recognize, then the tumor cell will be killed. But if the tumor cell is smart by maybe having some characteristics that cause the the, the, the immune cell not to identify them, basically the immune cell is sleeping and not doing its work, then of course the tumour will grow and the tumour will continue to cause problems. So with that, uh, researchers have looked at how we can overcome that kind of problems by, by uh, developing drugs that can actually identify and, and, and treat this tiny thing that, that uh, the cancer cells uh, uh, have and causes the cancer cell to be uh, to be resistant to our own immune cell. Okay, so there are many many immune uh, immunotherapy that is available for us to treat cancer. So these are the cancers that we have we have, we have used it in in, in, in our uh, uh, cancer therapies. Okay, and in fact that one is actually for advanced stage disease, and we even have immunotherapy to improve on patients who have stage three lung cancer, and this is in the curative setting. So, uh, I, I mean, actually in my last slides already, so in, in patients who have hereditary uh, condition, BRCA mutation 1 and 2, in these patients, not only that we can actually screen and try to prevent cancer from happening, but we also have uh, cancer treatment that is targeting uh, these patients who have BRCA and they have developed cancer. So, we have uh, drugs, okay, tablet that have been approved to treat patients who have the BRCA mutation and has had develop uh, cancers within their breast, their ovarian, as well as their pan uh, pancreas. So these are available and, and, and you can actually discuss this with your team that is managing. Okay? And I would like to end this with a tribute to all the cancer patients uh, in the country as well as in the world because without you, none of this would, would happen. We would not have learned so much, we would not have actually had this uh, treatment advances. So, so with that, I thank all of you. Okay, so there is a, uh, a question on how is targeted therapy incorporated in cancer treatment regimens? So, okay, so that's a very good question. Thank you for that question. So, how is targeted therapy incorporated in cancer treatment regimens will depend on what is the cancer type, whether um, what and what stage is the cancer type, and whether the, the person um, uh, if, the, if the targeted therapy needs a, a, a biomarker, means that we have to identify a target within the person's cancer, then only we can actually use the targeted therapy, then that has to be done first. So that is how we incorporate. But usually, generally now, uh, targeted therapy is incorporated in cancer treatment regimen uh, in advanced setting. We have fewer uh, targeted therapy used in earlier setting, more in the advanced uh, stage cancer setting, where we may actually combine it with um, uh, immune, uh, chemotherapy. We can use it just on its own. We can combine targeted therapy and targeted therapy, targeted therapy and uh, radiotherapy, targeted therapy and chemotherapy, depending on uh, what is the situation at hand. So that's how we, we, we combine it. So, and, and when and how it will be depending on uh, clinical data. That means there is, it, we, we can treat cancer using evidence based medicine nowadays. So, whatever that we suggest to you, will be based on what has uh, been proven or what has been proven to be effective in that, that patient uh, uh, condition. So that is how we incorporate it in our cancer therapy. And of course, we also have to discuss or, or think about what would be the, the potential side effect in the patient. So sometimes the patient may have uh, the indication, but there are some side effects uh, that, that the patient may potentially uh, develop and therefore we may not be able to actually give the patient that targeted therapy. So that has to be discussed. And the third thing that we uh, uh, consider before we incorporate it into our treatment regimen is cost. So cost, the cost of cancer therapy has escalated so much in the last 10, 20, 20 years. And this is, uh, this is something that we, is worthwhile for us to discuss with the patient before we incorporate uh, it in our cancer treatment regimen for, for the individual patient. 
So the second trick uh, question is how are the adverse effects of targeted therapy affect the overall quality of life? Okay, so this is also a very good question because um, targeted therapy is not uh, it's not water, basically. So targeted therapy is is a treatment that affect uh, the quality of life of a patient severely, and uh, the usual uh, side effects that that the targeted therapy induces are usually mild, and 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 it's. Quite, uh, it's kind of you can actually uh, overcome it. You can you can um, uh, uh, treat it or monitor it or even uh, or, or give some um, a modification to the dose or you know um, or, or changing the, the scheduling in order for us to manage the side effects. So uh, it doesn't actually affect the overall quality of life that much. And and in many of the clinical trials that uses targeted therapy, uh, they also look at the quality of life. Um, assessment in, in the clinical trial and in, I would say generally uh, the report has been put that it doesn't affect the quality of life of the patients uh, severely uh, so much so that the cost effectiveness of the treatment is, is, is low. Right. Thank, okay, thank you very much uh, for the session and I hope you guys have benefited from uh, the talk today.